countries like Hungary faced uh, issues, then there were concerns over Romania, Slovenia. The more interesting it makes for us uh, to talk about the uh, perspectives in these markets as of today. So, uh, without further ado, I will start with the main subject. You well know that fixed income markets in Eastern Europe and Central Europe are very different from one another. And that's where it becomes really interesting. For me, as a reporter, it is interesting to see uh, what are the reasons in the level of liquidity. I would like to talk about the markets in terms of volume and level of development, but uh, there's uh, not always sufficient liquidity. Or other markets may have uh, sufficient liquidity. Uh, they may see uh, a good healthy situation like the secondary market uh, in Czech Republic. Correct me if I'm wrong. But it's not one of the leaders in Eastern Europe. Let's talk about these differences, what the reasons behind them are. I would start with the right-hand side with uh, Yekaterina Trofimova. Uh, later on, I'm going to uh, introduce the rest of the panelists. Yekaterina Trofima is first vice president of Gazprom Bank. Uh, can you hear me? I have prepared some slides. Uh, let's start with them. Is it the presentation or we are answering the questions? I will provide a bridge to what you just said. Uh, it's probably the features of the human mind. The specific features of business operation, financial managers operate big size funds. Uh, so many questions to be uh, taken into account investment decision-making. Unfortunately or unfortunately, uh, that's the way human minds operates. And we have abbreviations like BRICS coming into being, or a CEE. Although geographically different people have different definitions of CEE, it has rightly been said that the countries are very diverse. Last week I read an article in Financial Times and there was one country you did not mention, Poland, and there was some lyrical portrayal. Probably it was a, s a Sunday news edition about a Portuguese family moving to Poland and they publicly admit that they, when they retire they will uh, come back to their countries only, but they will work in Poland. The countries are very diverse. Let's not forget Turkey. It has its uh, advantages, disadvantages and the debt market. To merge and bring together these countries into one grouping is not easy. Uh, so therefore the word diversification is um, very relevant in the title of this section. And decision making a very serious limitation for a more serious look at this region is the liquidity and the market size. To diversify, one should understand the pluses and minuses of the various forms of investment. Some of them are not very liquid, not very sizable, and uh, the economic case for in-depth study of the various specific features is um, sometimes questionable. And traditionally in the CE region, the interest of external investors is in the most liquid, um, most sizable markets from, for investments they make. If one tries to generalize, if you can show me the next slide, please. I have no control panel. Thank you. One should say that the debt burden in CE countries 
continues to be quite uh, moderate, which is a traditional indicator everybody is looking at. And no doubt it shows that uh, there is a potential for dead market growth, quite serious potential. Up until uh, we see a uh, uh, lending overload. So the level um, the, uh, the Slovenian banks are a source of concern more recently. Besides uh, credit risk, uh, in terms of currency risks that these countries represent, CDS uh, five years for various countries, and light colors show some C countries. The range is very wide. Uh, for Czech Republic is one thing, Poland. Uh, uh, similar, but uh, Ukraine is pretty high in government debt for currency volatility. In C, there's uh, pressure from decisions uh, taken in the core countries of the European Union with regard to TED market and securities. Uh, there is, of course, uncertainty related to Tobin tax, which may affect uh, uh, stock and debt market of C. With regard to currency volatility, which is important for foreign investors, including Russian investors in this region, has been uh, currency volatility has been quite moderate, and this slide shows average to monthly data. Traditionally, one talks about the prospects for economic growth. Ania would be uh, on the first to speak, so my purpose is to set the tone and provide traditionally cited data. And the prospects are good. We see global e economic slowdown. I believe that the current crisis is less uh, related to financial market. Uh, rather a slowdown of economic development worldwide, which was uh, visible early 2000 years. The emerging markets, which are still filling the technological gap, when I say technology is not only still making or casting, technology is about communications, uh, verbal communications, uh, business organization principles, decision making principles. And filling this technological gap uh, gives you good prospects for growth. That's a slide. Uh, uh, the trend in the world, the financial uh, flows coming back home, uh, reduction in activity, uh, outward activity, and that reduces the possibilities for uh, uh, raising funds externally. And this is quite a topical conference. For Russia, uh, companies from CEE uh, look at Russian investors with uh, good interest. They come and visit on a regular basis. And enhancement of this transporter dialogue and financial flows could be potentially a way to resolve the issues generated by the crisis. On behalf of uh, Gazprom Bank, I should tell you it is with interest, but uh, with some apprehension that we uh, uh, we're very careful in looking at CAA. But we see investment opportunities, but selective investment opportunities for ourselves, because currently um, uh, the prospects of many CA countries is a big question from the point of view of regular uh, resolution of the issues uh, for the near future. So much for what I had to say. I have the last slide with major conclusions. 
the debt burden, which is not uh, very high, about the potential for further growth, the European Union, which sets the tone to the regulative and general uh, development trend in uh, C reduction in um, declining transborder transactions. That makes this issue very topical, the increasing the range of investment partners and diversifying sources for raising funds and then attracting resources. If you could identify some specific countries of interest, not just the Gazprom Bank, which you mentioned your expert opinion. I think that yeah, unless one focuses on specific sectors and provide a general contact, that's what you started with, the most liquid market, even with high volatility. One cannot invest uh, without understanding the region has a wide range, various forms of regulation, market specific features and uh, one has to have analytical and managerial capability to understand this and invest these resources into small projects or markets is not efficient. So uh, this should be markets with good uh, growth prospects and most liquid. On the other hand, these are markets uh, that are of great disinterest and uh, there's less yield and profit. So the right way would be uh, to select uh, the most manageable um, specific projects. And this is less dependent on the market situation in specific markets or their liquidity. So it's more like project financing, uh, venture capital financing. So uh, that's why I said that our bank's interest is like this, selective investment into interesting uh, projects in terms of uh, return and understandable. I will not go clockwise, but I will give the floor to panelists depending upon what is more relevant to discuss. I would give the floor uh, to Istvan Toroshke, Chief Executive Officer of Debt Management Agency, Government of Hungary. Can one say that CE and debt markets in CE, they are kind of separate and different from others. Although Mrs. Trofimova showed on her slides that there is interest on the part of external investors, including Russian investors, but still the low liquidity level of most markets in CE uh, makes us uh, conclude that either the markets are undervalued or they are valued the way this historical uh, market situation allows them to be valued. Is it working? Thank you. Do I have to go over there or to talk? No, no, no. Can I sit here? Okay, I'd rather sit here then. <laughs> so, yeah, this is in my life because I'm a very young guy. Uh, in 1980, I was at the National Bank of Hungary at that time, and we had uh, some similar situation. At that time, the ex socialist countries, some of them went bankrupt, and everybody talked about at that time, Hungary is going to bankrupt. And uh, it was really a big fight, and uh, each morning we started uh, early in the morning, whether we can survive or not survive. We started normally in a minus balance sheet on, on our current account, and each, each evening we said, God, thank you, we survived again and postponed. And we, uh, what we learned and started to do that at the time, 
uh, try to be useful for the market. If you're useful for the market, then you can offer some service for the market. Then you can actually can get more and more friends. And then so we decided to start uh, making prices in the foreign exchange. At the time, you shouldn't forget the foreign exchange market was a very, very good market and very active market. And as we are price making with that one, sooner or later, within three years, virtually in 83, we were already accepted and we didn't have the day-to-day -day problem of how to financing ourselves. So we, we could start working on it, how to make the duration, everything in a, in a proper schedule. Now, but that was a big lesson and we learned it and we studied that we have to do something with, with the debt management. And obviously, in the middle of the you, you, you realize that sooner or later you're going to have a change of the economic regulation. You're going to make the uh, uh, system, the social system, perhaps you swap it for a, a, a capitalist system. And for that one, you need a good debt office. So we studied, went over to Scandinavia, even went to, to, uh, to China to, do, to look at it and study it, how they handling the debt, uh, debt uh, system. And we suggested the change in government at that time that should be an independent debt office, which handling the assets and the financing as well, uh, directly contacted to the parliament, and uh, the parliament make the limit what we can do and how we can do that. And there's no influence of, of the individual parties. I still think that would have been the best solution, but the, the party's interest was different. And we got a debt office which was created in, originally in 94, which virtually just one side of it is, is the financing side of it. So our job is to really to, to finance uh, uh, the government debt as, as, as long as, and as cheap as possible. So that's our situation. That's what, what, what we're doing on, on, the, on the situation. Now, uh, <clears throat> I was on the private sectors, and I was called back on the uh, 2011 uh, in November, when we again had a, a certain training experience on the, on the on the market, because there was a lot of uh, talks about that again, Hungary goes bankrupt, we cannot pay in our, our debt, and we just not good enough to survive. So we should follow the Greek situation, which was actually absolute bullshit. We didn't have any uh, similar problem like uh, the Greek, but you know, it's a psychological situation. If they're talking, 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 the sooner or later people uh, believe that one, and they start acting to that one. So two, 2011, uh, in November, when I took it over the debt office, coming back from the private sector, so the first thing was immediately that uh, try to, to quiet the market. We talked, 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 explaining where we are standing, what the government wants, how the government wants, and we tried to find different market uh, possibilities. That's why I came at that time to, to Russia in Moscow, because uh, we were planning to issuing uh, bonds in rubles, government, Hungarian government bonds in rubles. We still will do it sooner or later. Uh, but at the time, uh, we, we came here to see whether it's possible the Russian partner is interested or not. And then it started a sort of negotiation with the Russian partners, which is still uh, uh, it's, it's, it's getting better and better relationship. Then I went to the Far East, to China, to Tokyo, uh, Seoul, Singapore, and Istanbul to look at the uh, alternative possibilities, what actually how they look at it, the market, how they're regarding us and whether they can be a partner for us or not. And it definitely looked like it, it's, it's uh, the they were happy to do that. I mean, by uh, what was a big surprise for all of us, the domestic market we could finance ourselves. So that was the biggest surprise for, for all our uh, critical uh, partners that virtually we managed to finance all our debt, all our uh, uh, refinancing possibilities just on the Hungarian market. So, uh, and one of the secrets was uh, that, that the local inhabitants was encouraged to buy the government bonds because we looked at it, that's the, one of the stablest investments uh, because they're not changing. So they, they, there can be a lot of rumors, they're saying, okay, uh, everybody is selling, but they are not that quickly selling the bonds. So we're really making uh, 
products, different products, just to stabilize the, uh, the market and getting more and more the saving. The banks is not all that happy with that one, but uh, uh, with, we actually can always analyzing the situation and we don't want to, uh, to, to create a liquidity crisis. What we would like to get, we work together with the banks and encouraging the banks at, at the same time to get the, the money with what is actually free for the inhabitants to, uh, to investing in the government bonds. And for example, it's, it's in our plan now to making a, a certain, uh, uh, so certain called baby uh, uh, products, because it's, it's a government to encouraging the, uh, the rates of birth to get more and more baby, they actually offering a certain amount which, uh, uh, which they're fixing on an account or, or on the treasury. And on that account, what we would like to make a product to give them. And for the whole life of the, uh, studying the children and after the studying to, to set up a, a family, to, uh, if they're buying the uh, government bonds, they, they might get a certain benefit. So that's what we're thinking, to making the long-term uh, saving, which the best things for, for the economy. Now, what is, is, is the... Uh, so just to, to finish the shit on this sort of crisis what we started virtually uh, we solved that problem is now we don't need money we, we just uh, this year is almost recovered uh, or covered by the financing even in, in the for the next year we we, we covered we re, uh, re prepaid uh, the IMF uh, a certain part of the IMF loan what we borrowed in 2008 so is is now the uh, the country is definitely on on, on the financially is back to the normal what is is uh, we have to improve improve a lot that's actually is is the growth but a lot of talk uh, was here whether the uh, the growth can go or not can go uh, it's now the uh, the government is making a, a new effort to try to encourage uh, the small and medium sized company i would i would even say the micro company especially in the countryside uh, to start to work again so we have to reorganize after the successful privatization, what we had uh, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, virtually the countryside is fallen apart. Now we have to recover the countryside, mainly using the so-called cooperative system, what you know very well in United States or, or in, in Scandinavia or uh, in Belgium or uh, Denmark, is very successful. That's what we would like to reorganize it in Hungary as well making for the, uh, for the producers and for the financial issue uh, to be try to recovering the credit unions, what used to be very popular in Central Europe before the Second World War. After that, it was privatized, or not privatized, not privatized but uh, nationalized. We would like to do it again. What we're saying that please help yourself and God will help you. So that's the attitude. We don't wait anybody. We try to get ourselves and get organized, reorganizing ourselves. Now, that's what I wanted to tell you in, in advance. I don't know, should I answer in, uh, following what, what was the question or should we coming back later on? No, it would be nice if you answered the question now. If you nice if you could answer questions now. You portrayed the situation uh, from the perspective of Hungarian economy and the way you see it. If you could answer the question. And there's a follow-up question that I want to ask you. Based on what you have described, the strategic uh, is it true for other countries of CE? Strategically for Hungary in terms of debt market, the hope is for private investors and they will uh, ordinary people hungarians i understand that your strategy is in here private investors population at large yes actually we, we have a very well established uh, uh, system for the debt office so if i just very briefly explain you that uh, 
the Hungary started the transition to market economy, which started with that stock. Well, we, we actually created a well-developed primary and secondary market in the last 15 years. A complete and liquid yield curve up to 15 years, what we're producing. Transparent issuance strategy and calendar. So we, everything is, is, we can see it on the, on, on the website, so virtually absolutely transparent. Regular primary market issuance, primary auctions, what, we, what we're doing. Large enough and limited number of bond lines is normally two or three billion euro outstanding size lines. Regular use of reopening, transparent secondary market, MTS Hungary electronic trading system, daily publication for benchmark fixing, OTC, MTS Hungary and turnover, and so on. Active use of switch and buyback action also increase liquidity. Well developed and long established primary dealer system, transparent operation, well defined clear system of rights and obligation. Wide investor base, no capital control, free capital in and outflow, easy market access via intermediaries. And as we have the primary dealerships, and uh, virtually not only have Hungarian presence, this creating is really a very active uh, secondary and primary uh, tradings. And virtually, uh, I would say, as we is issuing twice a week, uh, either treasury bills or treasury bonds, which we're auctioning, it's normally, it's, it's around, uh, how much is it? It's, it's, it's around 100 uh, billion foreign the boss coming. And, and, and normally 2.5 oversubscribed as well. Now 50% normally foreign investors. The other 50 is local investors. Quite a big demand. Yeah, it, it, before I, I uh, last Thursday, remember the last auction, even I think it was uh, for the long term period, I think it was five times oversubscribed. You know, it's very simple. It's now the market is normally acting differently. So now they, they, we're not going bankrupt. That's, that's accepted now. Uh, now, the yield is relatively high compared to everybody else. It's a, well established uh, market. So people are quite happy to come. Are you changing your strategy for the near future? What is going to be priority area for your office? Speaking about the debt market in Hungary. Now, virtually, what obviously everybody's wish. Uh, to try to get a cheaper loan and, uh, and try to get a longer duration. Now that's what we try to do with the local market definitely in Hungary. And if you look at the yields curve, what actually started in a one and a half year ago, it definitely came down a lot. I think there's still rooms to come down a little bit, but it's not too, not as degree as it, it was before them. Uh, at the same time, we're looking for, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking and uh, uh, checking the Moscow market, what we can do here, whether we can use the local currency as a financing, because we would want to support the local market. If to go to Moscow, Istanbul, or Seoul, we would like to use the local currency, we swap it to euros. So that's what we would like to do that, because normally we keep our debt in foreign and euros. So that's what we do market. If we can say it, we look at it and check it. I understand uh, uh, what you were trying to say. Vadim Karablanin, the director of Treasury of MDM Bank. I know that you have a presentation of sorts. And then I will ask a question stemming from previous presentations. You can uh, speak from where you are.
Good afternoon. When I was invited to this event, uh, I was ashamed to find out that MDM Bank is an active uh, fixed income operator and is not uh, uh, working with instruments uh, issued by CE countries. And we looked at the reasons why. And we found out that we know so much less about the financial markets of these markets than about the cuisines and, uh, of those countries or about football teams of those countries or their national teams. And uh, having analyzed this situation, we realized that perhaps the time has come that we should take a closer look at these markets because the state of the Russian financial market and the Russian banking system uh, prompts uh, diversification of investment. Uh, the Russian banking system is characterized by some global features. Russian banks need capital. And the central bank is consistently tightening its uh, policy with regard to banking capital requirements. And the uh, central bank, on a regular basis, issues documents uh, making it more difficult for banks to deal with certain assets. And that applies to uh, debt instruments as well. The most recent change that the Russian Central Bank introduced has led to a situation where most traditional fixed uh, income instruments has a much larger capital burden <coughs> and N1 uh, size is so much more now. <coughs> the most popular instruments in the Russian market are uh, bank bonds. <coughs> yeah, so bonds are, uh, the burden is 1.5 uh, higher than uh, <coughs> and a standard commercial loan. This slide shows uh, recent changes in uh, banking regulation uh, which has led to a situation where currently out of total issues only 9% have investment ratings. Uh, in terms of size and volume or the number of issues, I mean Russian local bonds. Currently, uh, it, it does not present a big burden on the capital, only 42%, and the margin, as you can see, has been going down recently. We calculate the margin uh, versus the most popular funding instruments, which are uh, repo operations with the central bank. Previously, the margins for Russian ruble bonds, uh, federal loan bonds, was 2.53 percent. Currently, it's 1 to 1.5 percent. This brings about the conclusion we need to uh, find better margins. We need to find facilities with uh, low capital burden. If we look at the uh, sovereign debt market in Central and Eastern Europe, we will see that the requirements for such facilities are met in five countries, uh, Czech Republic, Estonia, Slovenia and Poland. For obvious reasons, we are not looking into investment in Slovenia. There are valid concerns over the 
security of this market, which could be subject to certain negative things. Uh, Katerina was right when she said that uh, market participants are especially keen on the level of liquidity. If we look at the volume of public debt in these countries, it is obvious that uh, Polish facilities are liquid enough. Uh, the same is true for Hungary, Czech Republic, and a few other countries of the region. If we look at all the constraints, though, altogether, uh, which impact our ability to use these facilities, we see that we can only look at Poland and Czech Republic for real investment. Uh, they have a rating higher than what we see in Russia. On the other hand, uh, the level of liquidity is uh, quite sufficient. If you look at the margins or yields, you can see that uh, Russian bond yields are comparable to uh, Polish uh, bonds and uh, euro bonds. Uh, Polish bonds have a high rating. Uh, these facilities have been issued in Germany uh, despite high credit quality. Uh, these facilities are less attractive uh, to us because of lower yields. We have analyzed euro bonds issued in uh, Poland and in Russia with a maturity in 22. We see that uh, they act in the same way. Uh, in uh, some areas there is an opportunity to uh, do swap trading, but uh, we do not have uh, much of experience in using such facilities. So all this is uh, somewhat premature for us. Uh, this can be uh, viewed as a way to uh, diversify our portfolio. Now then, let's look at the factors which hold back Russian investors. Investors are concerned about possible risks, crisis in Cyprus, continuous discussions of sovereign debt a crisis in Europe, and uh, that makes them very reserved in their attitude to new facilities. Even when they look at Russian instruments, the demand is extremely low. It was very interesting for me to uh, hear the presentation by th our uh, Hungarian colleague. Uh, they have advanced uh, quite far uh, down that road. The most relevant uh, issue which acts as a constraint for us, and I don't know how it can be addressed, is that uh, the uh, global recession of 2008 showed that uh, public authorities and central banks uh, can uh, save investors. We understand that if we see another crisis comparable to that of 2008, uh, through investment in uh, Russian instruments, we can get uh, guaranteed uh, funding uh, from the Central Bank of Russia. Uh, what if the crisis hits and uh, we need to uh, get uh, funds uh, from Central and Eastern Europe? We do not know. Uh, when things go well, Raising funds uh, through international banks is uh, not an issue, but uh, if crisis begins, uh, this could begin become a global problem. Uh, this is all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vadim. I have a question for you. You have given us a few uh, 
facts about the constraints which are valid today, but they are fairly new constraints. What were the constraints uh, that held our investors' activities in the past? Uh, I remember there was a publication by Mr. Lukayev where he uh, referred uh, to uh, the uh, debt market uh, in Poland. Uh, it was well known that uh, Poland is uh, much more advanced uh, than we are. They made uh, much more progress. Why we have not paid attention uh, to those developments? I think it's fairly simple. Uh, in the past, we were not happy uh, with the level of margin uh, we could get there because uh, yields in Russian instruments were much higher. Uh, it's only now that they are on a par with each other. Uh, two, uh, there was lack of knowledge in the Russian banks. Uh, people are not familiar with that market. They have little idea how it works. And this is uh, something that takes quite a bit of learning. Uh, another consideration, uh, internal banking procedures in Russian banks are quite complex. Risk managers who are responsible for uh, setting limits for different facilities, they uh, do not have uh, sufficient knowledge of uh, those markets. They need uh, to uh, learn about those markets. And again, there is little demand uh, from customers. Uh, there's uh, some demand for Russian facilities, but uh, nobody's asking about the instruments from Eastern Europe. Now, I would like to pass the floor uh, to David uh, Semera, who is the Deputy Chairman uh, of the Board and Head of Finance Division of uh, OTP Bank Hungary. So, dear colleagues, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak in front of you. Uh, I will speak about the investments in the uh, financial sector and in banks in Central and Eastern Europe as an asset class. Um, I would like to uh, refer back to what was said before. Uh, actually, when it comes to investments in the region, I think the key is what uh, Yakotina not said is that uh, actually you need to understand these markets. Uh, Central and Eastern Europe is a very uh, diverse uh, region. Uh, when it comes to investments, not just bond investments, but high uh, regional company like OTP makes its investment decisions, actually you really need to go down into the details which market segments can offer growth, which countries uh, are a good investment uh, target, and what the risks are. In my presentation, I will touch, uh, I will have just uh, one slide on the macroeconomic situation in the region. Uh, this has been mostly covered already. Uh, when it comes to banks as an asset class, the depth of financial intermediation is really the driver of, of growth in the future. Um, we see that uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, in Russia, and in many other markets, emerging markets, we see that uh, the best risk return balance can be seen in retail lending. Uh, I will give you a little bit of perspective why and, and what we can see in, the, in various countries. Uh, after, war, after that, I will speak about, uh, each con about each country a little bit. What are the financial indicators of the banking system? Uh, how successful investments have, been, have already been uh, in these countries? And in the fifth part of the presentation, I will um, show how investment flows actually take, uh, take place in the region. Um, in the afterwards, in the presentation, which will probably be, be distributed to you, there are case studies by country and country, which you're really uh, welcome to use later on. 
so uh, when it comes to the macroeconomic situation, uh, most of this has been covered or already in the previous presentations. Uh, obviously, we can see that uh, GDP per capita is lower in the region than in uh, Western European countries. Uh, so, some Central and Eastern. Some Central and Eastern European economies already reached 60 or 80 percent of every GDP per capita level of the EU, but there is still room for growth. Uh, okay, so uh, well, obviously the most important driver of, of uh, banking sector intermediation and uh, and and uh, the financial results of the banking system in all of these countries is, uh, one of them is economic growth. Uh, we can see that uh, most of these countries, uh, when we analyze them, there is uh, a catch-up, hopefully a catch-up to uh, the EU's average. We can see that uh, many countries have quite high human development indices, uh, that means that uh, even though in Central and Eastern European countries we have higher volatility of economic growth because there is higher dependence on exports and capital flows, still we foresee that there will be a catch-up. Uh, despite the situation, and this is what I uh, really try to explain, you need to analyze all of these countries one by one. We can see uh, higher economic growth in Poland, in Romania, and in Bulgaria. Uh, here, growth will be almost 1.5%. And obviously, we are very bullish on, on the uh, Russian economy with its over 3% economic growth relative to Western Europe or any of the other uh, Central and Eastern European countries. Really, the other important driver of growth in the financial sector, in the banking sector of, of Central and Eastern Europe, is the relatively low level of financial intermediation, as uh, usually it is, all the, it is looked like uh, penetration, volume of credit, uh, private sector debt relative to GDP. Also, uh, we can... We we can still see that the financial sector of Central and Eastern Europe is relatively underdeveloped relative to uh, Western and Eastern Europe. Uh, to Western Europe, the, rel the region's GDP is roughly 30% that of uh, the euro area, and the outstanding loan volume is only 9%. Uh, this would forecast uh, very good growth in terms of financial instruments. Also, it's very uh, interesting to look at how uh, not just at the uh, private debt to GDP, but also retail lending relative to GDP. Here we can see that the uh, Central and Eastern European region still has a very high potential. Also, uh, for you as investors, when you're looking at specific names, it will be very interesting to look at the composition of retail lending, whether or not it's mortgage, uh, whether or not it's more uh, non-secured lending. This will have a very important impact in terms of uh, return on equity, in terms of the margins uh, in these countries. Uh, when it comes to uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, we see a lot of room in terms of the deepening of the financial system. Uh, in many uh, countries which are the members of the European Union already, we can see a big increase in terms of uh, mortgage volumes. This, the driver of this mortgage boom in most of these countries were a very low interest rate environment or very lavish state subsidies. 
which we uh, cannot see in Russia. And in terms of, of uh, uh, relative indicators, in terms of, of penetration levels, still uh, we think that, the, uh, that actually the Russian uh, banking sector is the, offers the most uh, development potential. On this slide, I would like to be a little bit more specific. Uh, this slide is about retail lending in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the countries, the retail, mar retail lending markets of these countries are plotted uh, in a way that it shows loans to GDP in 2011. That is the depth of the financial markets. And on the... Uh, vertical axis you can see CAGR, the growth rates uh, from 2004 and 2011. We can see that the financial market sizes are really, uh, of the whole area combined, is really much slow, smaller even if we just compare it to one country, uh, Germany. Having said that, in terms of growth rates, and which is a very good proxy for uh, profitability and a very good proxy for the opportunities that are ahead of us. We can see that uh, Russia, Romania, Poland, all of the Central and Eastern European countries have had much higher growth rates uh, than uh, Western European countries. Before the crisis, we, we saw in all of these countries growth rates of 20 and 40%. Uh, b given the lower penetration levels, uh, if uh, faster economic growth starts, this will be a uh, very interesting and very good market for uh, all of the investors. Uh, this slide is about uh, investments in the financial sector in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Actually, for equity investors, uh, Central and Eastern European uh, banking, before the 2008 crisis, one of, was one of the stars. Uh, that's where everyone uh, invested. And this is because of the very high return on equity levels we, can, we saw in this sector. Uh, in 2005, uh, Russian banking sector's return on equity was uh, well over 20%, and the same was true for Hungary, and all of the countries, uh, nearly all of the countries had much higher uh, return on equity ratios than in Western Europe. Then obviously came the crisis, where we can see that uh, there is more volatility in the in the country uh, in the uh, financial indicators of the uh, banking sector, especially uh, in some of the Central and Eastern European countries. In 2011, actually, uh, two countries had negative return on equity uh, because of lower growth and uh, because of changes in the regulatory environment. Uh, when it comes to uh, where you put your money as bond investors. Uh, MPL dynamics, uh, country by country, is very important. The driver of re re return on equity in, s in most of the countries were uh, less payment discipline and higher, higher MPLs, and in some of the countries that was more the change of the regulatory environment. But we can see that even uh, Central and Eastern Europe cannot be looked at as one market. We can see really different trends among the uh, uh, MPL, non-performing loan rates, country by country. We can see that after the crisis, actually, Russia and Slovakia fared much better than any other part of the uh, Central and Eastern uh, European universe. Uh, 
when it comes to the banking sectors and uh, we are doing internally uh, profitable uh, modeling when we are looking at uh, which countries to invest in, where you can see the growth, where you can see the uh, best returns. Um, actually, Russia is still uh, one of the most interesting markets uh, investment-wise. For the uh, development of the financial sector, uh, before 2008, actually uh, the left slide was uh, always shown. Uh, foreign direct investment was regarded as a proxy of uh, good banking management. Uh, before 2008, always it was stated that uh, uh, in countries where there is uh, a high share of foreign investors that is very sure uh, these, especially in the banking sector, most of this investment was from uh, professional investors, that is banks, rather, rather than uh, asset managers. Uh, these companies came to the Central and Eastern European uh, area because of the higher margins. We can see that still, uh, after, the, uh, after 2008, uh, most of these investors are, are he here to stay in the region. And also, there is a new trend, and that uh, trend is really the uh, localization or regionalization of investments. Uh, local banks especially banks from Russia, uh, started expansion in the Central and Eastern uh, European area. And when we look at uh, uh, m and uh, volumes, we can see that uh, most of the investments before uh, were across the border. Across the border here means that is um, inter-regional. So the border being uh, Central and Eastern Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, in 2011 and in 2012, actually we can see that the, most of the investments are actually taking place within the Central and Eastern European uh, region. And this one is being sp spearheaded uh, by some of the Russian banks. So uh, when it came to the uh, specifics of uh, investing into uh, banks, uh, this was the overview of the situation. Really, uh, I think for investors, there are two very important takeaways. Uh, one of them is the actually the Russian market seems to be the uh, most interesting uh, markets in terms of growth and in terms of uh, stability because of the uh, overall uh, economy. Also, when it comes to investment, it's really important to understand each country and uh, country by country. And really, I would again like to refer back to what Ekaterina said. You know, you would really need uh, to look at the investments one by one, uh, looking for uh, particular uh, opportunities, opportunities rather rather than. Uh, looking at the whole area as an asset class or as uh, one investment. So, uh, thank you very much for your attention and thank you. Спасибо большое, Давид. Ну, я тогда, чтобы пауза. Thank you, David. Uh, let me introduce to you Ulug Bak Suyumov. Of Banco Espirito Santo. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, David has uh, taken us to a very interesting discussion. Uh, we have looked at differences uh, between markets of uh, CE economies. Uh, now uh, we can talk about the prospects. My name is Ulugbek Asuyumov. I have lived in Portugal for 20 years. I can speak Russian, if I may.
it's a big surprise that uh, OTP Bank is uh, represented here. I'm very happy because we have a strategic agreement. We build bridges uh, between the West and East. Uh, OTP Bank covers nine countries. We are present in 25 countries. But this does not include uh, countries where OTP Bank uh, does most of its work. So uh, we have very good cooperation. Uh, before you start asking me about Cyprus, I want to uh, give you my uh, PowerPoint presentation and then you can start bombarding me with Cyprus-related questions or what uh, one can shop for in Portugal because we have a, a big sales season now. Uh, people like to go shopping when uh, stores uh, offer big sales. Uh, I'm going to try to show you in my presentation that every crisis uh, at the same time offers big opportunities to enter markets. You know that uh, we have the big three, uh, IMF, uh, European Union and uh, European Central Bank. Uh, they have offered uh, 78 billion uh, euros. I'm not going to go into uh, details on that, but uh, if somebody needs uh, detailed information, I can make sure that you get it. So Portugal is doing the homework, and I can tell you why we are different than Greece, uh, Spain, and several other countries. Uh, in uh, many contexts, those countries are looked at as one whole. We have political stability because 80% of the parliament uh, are represented by uh, three parties, uh, PSD, uh, CDSPP, and uh, PS. Uh, they account for 80% uh, of all uh, parliament members. Uh, representatives of these uh, three parties have signed um, MOU uh, with the big uh, three sponsors and have committed uh, to perform structural reform uh, in Portuguese economy, which should uh, bring about serious deleverage. Ireland uh, had a problem with banks. They had banks which uh, were over -dated. Spain uh, had an issue with real estate, and we're going to look at that. Then uh, came Cyprus, and we're going to talk about it in a few. IMF has just completed their seventh review, and they are giving us uh, fairly good results. So we look very bright. Uh, although in the last uh, 20 years we have not really shined uh, and uh, we have accumulated quite a bit of death, debt. What are the opportunities uh, that present themselves in Portugal? Let's look at privatization. Uh, China has paid $2.7 billion uh, and bought uh, ODP. Uh, that is the biggest uh, electrical company in Portugal. In the first year, they have received $144 uh, million of dividends. They can very quickly recoup that investment. When rating agencies came uh, in uh, two or three years, they gave us uh, several downgrades. So apples fell from the tree, and now investors are coming over, and they are picking those apples. They are picking big fruits at good discounts. I think that this is a very good opportunity. This is a very good time for Russian investors. Uh, there is little information uh, available about uh, our market. Look at Gulp. This is a Portugal uh, company which has a very good network uh, in uh, gas distribution. They have chain of gas stations. If uh, Gazprom or Luke Oil uh, buys a share of Gulp, they could uh, 
affect uh, the uh, decision making uh, that takes place in that company uh, and currently that uh, company buys uh, most of its uh, gas uh, from Algeria uh, that could change in favor of Russia I'm myself uh, originally from Uzbekistan I studied in the United States for three years there were twin cities uh, Moscow Washington DC Tashkent and Seattle, and I moved to Seattle from Tashkent. I studied for three years in the United States, to two years in United World College, 200 students from 70 countries, and then Portugal. And there are questions why Portuguese? Stop nebo, not have any doubts. I studied Portuguese when I came to 93. I did not speak Portuguese. I studied Portuguese. It was a surprise. For me, there are 256 million speaking Portuguese world over. Although there are 10 million people in Portugal. And uh, Russian investors can use Portugal as a, uh, a launching pad. Mozambique, uh, Cabo Verde, so many other countries where we have representations. Let us look at the Portuguese banking sector. Now we uh, see transformations in the banking sector. The target in terms of debt to deposit ratio is 120. By 2014, uh, we shall achieve that, hopefully. Look at the deposits. That's the slide on the right hand side. Portugal compared to Ireland and Greece and Spain. One could think that Portugal is in a crisis, then all deposits must have been moved elsewhere. But it's not what we see. Uh, many people are also saying that Portugal is very much dependent on the ECB. And I'm showing you here a chart where in terms of the percentage of GDP and the percentage of bank assets, Portugal has 28.7% of percentage of GDP and 8.6% of bank assets. We need to do our homework, but this homework, it will be easier for us to do that because we never had a real estate crisis of uh, the kind that the Spain has had. Uh, the slide, chart on the left hand side shows that 2008-2012 real estate prices uh, have grown 96 percent. Uh, it's been 96, accumulated real price growth. In Portugal 7 percent. And so they brought all the non-performing loans in Bankia and are uh, restructuring it. We don't have this uh, problem in Portugal, so the real estate prices have gone, gone down and are even rising. Octo last October a new law was uh, decreed in Portugal. Everybody who is buying a real estate uh, of uh, 500,000 euros minimum uh, giving a residence permit in Schengen and then can uh, later apply for citizenship. We have investors from Russia, Brazil, China, India and they are uh, stunned by the country's beaches, uh, sunshine. You can swim from May to September it's more difficult to work there in uh, Portugal. You have to make yourself sit in the office. Welcome to Spain. You can have a CFA conference next year in Portugal. I'm a leader of the group there, which is uh, organizing a CFA association in Portugal. We have uh, uh, 82 CFA uh, charter holders. It's time for us to have a society so we'll be looking forward to your response. A few more slides, <coughs> quickly. Uh, you may not see it clearly. Uh, 
since April 2011, the bond market was, has been closed. When I was invited to talk about the bond market, I, I represent the Spiritu Santo, the second largest bank in terms of assets. We have about 19 billion euros of assets. We are the biggest uh, listed bank, 4 billion uh, and the first bank to go into the exchange. We had an issue in November on uh, a three-year uh, bonds. And the investors of UK, France, Switzerland, Portugal, 64% of fund managers, hedge funds, 13%. Portugal is not seen as a high yielder, and the real risk is not is much uh, uh, lower. If uh, there's interest. We would like to look at the possibility to issue ruble nominate, denominated the issues, something our colleague was discussing before. This is a Euroweek slide. After the our bank uh, opened up this uh, Eurobond market, Euroweek dedicated a page to us. And SoftGen Mezuko Securities uh, provide a very positive. Uh, bank has proclaimed renewed business confidence as the bank printed the first public senior secured deal in more than two and a half years. We're trying to move forward. How and why did we manage in a period of crisis? to issue successfully these bonds. If you look at this chart, we got nothing from the state. There are four other banks in Portugal who used one to three billion euros of uh, government aid. We have a courtier one ratio, quite strong. If you look at solvency ratios in Portugal, which is the central bank is 10% uh, minimum. European Banking Authority, the minimum is 9% starting June 2012. And by all both indicators, our capital is, uh, is a higher level than the, uh, the requirement level. Uh, why and how did we manage to be consistent in our strategy? And this during this crisis, the bank has been in existence for 144 years. Ricardo Spirito Santo was a grand great grandfather of uh, the current president. It's a dynasty of bankers. Bankers had a very stable strategy, and we have stable shareholders. 53 percent is owned by strategic shareholders, Credit Agricole, uh, Spirito Santo family, Portugal Telecom, and the second largest Brazilian bank has 8.3. We invite Russian managers to uh, come to our equity story page. I've been in investor relations for many years. I can talk for hours. A very good case, very instructive. I think after this session, we can discuss this, uh, separately. And I give the floor to Peter Kadish from uh, Metropole. Yeah, and also we'll need to hear questions. Peter Kadish. I could hear my Portuguese colleague. And I think I decided to buy something. 
in Portugal. I have two slides. Uh, Metropole is uh, dealing with uh, local the bonds, uh, federal loan bonds, futures on the federal loan bonds, and I will more look at the economic case and look at the developing countries from the point of view of the global pictures to identify trends. And I will look at Russia as a case. I will call it from the NDM Bank has identified a very important thing, uh, important for understanding why liquidity exchange between developing economies is pretty limited. If one ask a, tr a trader why people buy a bond or don't buy, the criteria is simple. Can I uh, use it as a security with the central bank? Uh, sooner or later, uh, day X uh, comes when everything goes down. And so the choice is simple. What if this day X happens? So there's no question whether it will come. We could see that volatility in the markets can be very high. Therefore, it would be right to say, from the point of inflow and money for a debt market, to see how it comes in developed markets. It can generate uh, uh, funds based on the way the financial system is functioning worldwide. One thing is the long term trend for reducing rates is over. We don't know for how long this will continue to be zero. The gap between developed and developed markets is pretty high. And this determines the trend that we have seen for at least a year. The inflow of money into developing markets are more into fixed income. People want to go away as far as possible from volatility. Fixed income products are less volatile than equity markets. Therefore, the structure of uh, the flow of money into developing countries is moving toward fixed income. We see record high issues, on high yield bonds across the board in developing economies. During the past year, it was maximum if you look at these 10 years. Today, during three years, it's growing three times as fast as on the average since 2010. The tendency is there, and that capital market story is comparable probably uh, in Japan, uh, and this for a while can be quite a long time. Uh, just talking about Russia, how it is positioned to accept and receive money from outside. Uh, because there's so much money going into developing economies. Russia is making uh, successful steps. The quality of the curve is becoming better. Uh, the euro bond market is underdeveloped relatively when try to chart a curve. This is a federal loan bond curve. I'll show you what has been happening for the past two years. It is clear from this chart, as has rightly been said, if we shift from top-down approach, then the specific features of the economy will determine what is happening in the specific countries, although the global trend will certainly uh, determine what is happening in each country. In Russia, this green curve um, Green curve is a federal loan bond, and yellow is what was uh, two years ago. And the uh, central bank tried to raise the rate, and the yellow curve grew. On the other hand, the opening of the Euroclear, the window that allows Russia to get investment from outside, 
and allowed us to reduce the long-term yields. Since everybody wants to make money, nobody came up with anything new. And that continues to be a driver for what's happening in the bond market. So these two factors made this uh, Russian curve very flat. I'm not sure which curves, what kind of curves are there in CE, I mean, I assume they are becoming flatter because those countries absorb the incoming capital. If one looks at the macroeconomic story, it is good. Let's create an infrastructure and the curve to absorb this money. But the important thing, how we use this money. If this money is used for uh, consumer loans, a real estate bubble, that uh, for some time the economic growth may be high, but at the end of the day there will be a crisis. If the economy cannot absorb effectively the money which is coming in, which is not good. Fixed income market is very much related to the way the economy is structured overall. Therefore, for Russia, I should say, it's not always that there's a possibility to effectively uh, invest and uh, utilize money. Yes, for some specific project, but compared to other countries overall, the likelihood of a bubble is quite high in Russia. I can cite an example where the central bank There are two barriers uh, for the central bank. If we reduce the rate, we they make the economy less attractive. But uh, it, uh, in, inside the country, everybody begins to take loans. If we make the rate high, then the foreigners will inject money. We'll see how. Russia, Russia will perform during the next several years, but the level of debt is pretty low. In Russia, the expected issue for the next year is pretty small among emerging markets. It's any inflow through Euroclear can seriously affect the value, the price. The incoming money is less stable than the money generated inside the country. And this is uh, where the Eastern Europe has suffered so much. It's good they had this floating rate, inflexible rate. And so the uh, currency was devalued and the exports increased. On the other hand, uh, the rates were, were low. And uh, when, during the crisis, uh, it was difficult for people to repay the loans. Yeah, money from outside is good, but if it goes to real estate only, it's not good. I can only tell you that from the point of macroeconomic perspective, we try to look at what is happening worldwide and the tendency for a fixed income market to outperform equities is quite obvious. We see the by incoming flows into all emerging economies. We see it from the yields of uh, government and corporate bonds compared to equity markets. Yesterday, the OFZ market in dollars, 23% uh, for six-year bonds. The bond market, the bond story is becoming more and more important for each country. The question is, what are you going to do with this? Thank you very much, indeed. Dear colleagues, we have a little time left. We need to actually uh, Finished the session. We have received uh, answers to many questions. There were presentations from inside the ECE. We heard the perspective of Russian banks. If there are questions from the floor on the topic of this session, 
we would be happy to respond. If not, we'll move to a close. Any questions? Good. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Victor from Czech Republic. My question is goes to Russian banks. Do Russian banks consider the possibility of creating their own funds or probably entering the existing funds in CE, in Czech Republic specifically? Funds that own big commercial entities and make money on leasing those entities with the uh, income being 5 to 7 percent. We see some interest on the part of Asia, Israel. So what would be the Russian bank's attitude? A very precise question. Anybody wants to answer? I would start by general comment. Such form of is interesting without uh, specifying a geographic region. Recently, we have launched a fund of this sort for operation with Italian partners and Sindesa San Paolo. And we consider uh, some project like this in some other uh, markets besides the specific substance of the project. It's uh, important to select and choose the right partner very carefully. maybe not very high transborder activity historically impedes uh, uh, implementation of such project with Russian project. There should be some experience accumulated and uh, greater activity on the part of investors in terms of contacts and familiarization with those uh, markets. And entities are sometimes take part in negotiations and and this work is not as systematic as it should be uh, for some potential interest to be transformed converted into specific projects but him Katerina was right in uh, saying what she said I agree with her this is interesting but I should not hope that there will be a quick and uh, success. There should be very careful analysis. For most the Russian financial institutions, it's something new. We're together with colleagues, with the right partners from those countries. It will take long for us to enter those markets. Yes, but not quickly. Not 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 now. Not immediately. One more kind of uh, joking uh, comment with regard to discounts in Europe as the most uh, recent experience has shown perhaps one should wait a little bit for greater discounts in Europe <laughs> from the floor Anton Spuntov, a speaker from the previous session. My question goes to Ekaterina. You said the prospects of the region in CE Here is a big question. If you could tell us the negatives, the negative scenario, worst case, you want to test the depth of my imagination. No, no, you may have some established opinion of you. Uh, CE is a fragmented uh, kind of various varying picture varying from country to country including the prospects much has been said about other cases and uh, Cyprus was mentioned only in passing the development of the Cyprus story uh, raises a question on how the situation is going to develop of a possible support for the economy of Cyprus, and this will uh, determine the prospects for CE economy in the future. There are more questions than answers currently. And I have mentioned in passing uh, my own view of development of the world crisis, global crisis, 
in terms of attempts to go back to pre-2008, this is not going to happen. We will see a lot of volatility. Historically, we have entered like 19th, 18th, 17th century, the period of a slow growth, uh, which uh, is uh, due to technological uh, uh, slowdown. And uh, we should not uh, rush with transborder investment because there will be more than greater discounts. So we have seen very few defaults so far, which is not uh, normal. The situation in Cyprus will develop, and one should monitor the debts is accumulated. Yeah, the crisis provides an opportunity for investment from the point of uh, scenarios. I'm not in favor of uh, uh, any catastrophic uh, predictions. So what we are going to see is uh, uh, volatility uh, with shocks. I think we need more defaults. I'm not for letting uh, this. This is going to be. May, it will make the situation healthier. I'm not bloodthirsty, but still. Ekaterina said that Western banks should uh, reduce their assets by three to four trillion in the near future. And David was telling us about m and uh, in the region, in the banking sector. My question is, the banks sell, Western banks sell in the CE, who will buy? Good question. Most important, one of the key questions. Uh, there are answers, I think. A very good question. Our bank, in the past two years, have sold 2.5 billion of international project finance. And before 2007 and 8 crisis, we have very good uh, international project finance activity. We built an advisory team. We built a no two stadium. The VTB talked to us because they want to build a VTB arena, perhaps much larger than O2, much as being built in St. Pete. We'll try to assist. Now the cost of funding has gone up considerably. Uh, uh, profitable projects are not as profitable as they are, and we are selling them. If there's an interest, banks are interested in good projects, international project finance, where the funding costs are low, we can talk. Can be good deals in this area as well. With regard to uh, discounts, whether well, this is good uh, entry time, since it's a CFA conference, how many CFA uh, candidates or charter holders? 50%. For those who may not know, there's a herding behavior. When everybody begins to buy, it will be late. I agree that one should wait, that volatility will be high, but with all this volatility, I, for one, when I buy shares, yeah, for 20 days, it's 20, 30% discount, 40% discount. But if I manage to get a 30% discount, when it gets back, I gain 220. The Hungary case was quite instructive. My colleagues, economic journalists and many experts, they display a lot of inertia. And, uh, and uh, this is very much, we're still uh, developing uh, bubbles and uh, in the media, business media. And people are working to correct it always successful. But the story, uh, the Hungarian uh, story, is an answer to your question. There is a demand. Uh, I have a couple of more questions. Uh, David, you mentioned Romania as uh, one of the prospective markets in terms of retail banking. Then you said that they had uh, more than 15% of non-performing loans. 
this uh, sounds like two contradictory pieces of information. If uh, they have good prospects in retail, uh, and uh, at the same time, 15% uh, of NPLs, When we look at uh, the current NPL numbers, uh, that's what they have at this point in time. Uh, but at the same time, we know that uh, they are quite stable. When we look at the future opportunities, we, we think that uh, and that's not just my opinion, that's uh, the opinion of the group. We believe that uh, the biggest opportunities will present themselves uh, in Russia. Okay, good. I can uh, comment on the previous question you asked, who is going to be the buyer? We think that Russian banks, uh, like Sberbank, have become quite active in acquisitions. They are looking to buy banks in Central and Eastern Europe. There are other banks that are doing well, and they have an opportunity to buy, and they have a capability. So we are looking into possible deals. But all textbooks say that uh, M and A transactions are good for sellers. This is a joke. Uh, one always has to look very specifically uh, what is out there for sale. In M and A's, I think discipline is essential. Uh, one has to understand uh, very well what the purpose of an investment is. When we entertain deals in Russia, it won't take so long to buy a regional bank, but uh, owners of those banks uh, know that too, and their expectations are high. So you are waiting till they are more affordable? No, we have a different option. We can. Uh, develop organically, that uh, is going to come at lower cost. Uh, one final question for uh, Mr. Karablin. You said that the margin was getting lower, uh, down to 1% uh, plus. Is my understanding correct that when you are making money off uh, repo deals, uh, your uh, liver increases, or this is not the case with these uh, transactions? Right. Uh, the margin is decreasing, and uh, uh, to uh, maintain the uh, same level of income, we have to, uh, again, address the capital uh, problem, uh, which is not very really relevant for our bank, though. Uh, thank you very much for participating in our discussions. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to uh, the audience. And uh, this completes the session.